Welcome everyone. This is our first time online tree tour. It's the Arbor Day tree tour. It's the social distancing tree tour and it's also the prickly tree tour. So trees have some social distancing just like we do. Well, maybe not just like it. So like any organism, trees need to defend themselves from being eaten, and one way to do that is to protect themselves mechanically as opposed to chemically or um, otherwise. So they arm themselves. And I've chosen six prickly trees to introduce you to today on this Whitman College campus tour. I'm Suzanne Alterman. I'm a lecturer here in biology at Whitman College, and this is our fourth annual campus tree tour. I'll be showing you photos of the six trees as well as a map to help you find them. You can come and visit the trees on your own time, and it's easy to practice social distancing when visiting with trees. I'm making this video in exactly the same way that I'm lecturing for my students now under the constraints of online teaching and learning. So you'll get a taste of what that might be like for our students. So now, all sharp objects from trees are not necessarily for defense. So here is a woody fruit of liquid ambar, styrasiflua, the sweet gum, a very common street tree. And this prickly fruit that you don't ever want to step on uh, may have the advantage of attaching to the fur of animals as a means of seed dispersal. So it may not be about protection of the seeds. If you want to visit this particular sweet gum, it's between Mem and Penrose Library. But that, of course, is not our focus today. And our tree tour is going to take place at three main locations. So I'm calling them zones, zones one, two, and three. The first one is Sudakawa Fountain. We have several trees there. Baker Street, we have a couple trees there. And then lastly, over at Shady Rill Street, not a common place for us to go to. Uh, we're going to talk about a tree there as well. So let's get started. This is Sudakawa Fountain. You may not know it by its name. And this is not a fountain tour, but I, I, I wanted to include something about the artist who created this fountain. His name was George Sudakawa, and he was 81 when he cast this fountain in 1991. He was born in Seattle in 1910. He moved to Japan at the age of seven, and it was just a year later that his mother died of Spanish flu. That was 1918. So there's, there's, a, there's a connection there with what's going on here. It kind of rhymes. He returned to the United States when he was 16, and he served in World War II before becoming an artist. All right, so the Sudakawa Fountain uh, hosts several trees right around it. We're going to talk about three of them. The first one is the hawthorn. Hawthorn. It's an example of a tree that leafs out before it blooms. So unlike our many of our cherries, where they bloom first and then they leaf out, we also see that in other spectacular members of the rose family, think crab apples. There are many cultivars of hawthorn, and in addition to being bred for their intense bloom, they are also bred to not produce their natural thorns. Even on thornless cultivars, you can find reversions to the thorny ancestor. So can you make out here, that is the tip of the thorn, and look at how stout it is. It goes all the way back to this main branch. This is an intimidating plant when you come up against these thorns. And imagine biting into this. If you were an herbivore after some soft green leaves, you'd get to that thorn and boy, that would make you think twice. 
about eating from this tree. So when you visit this hawthorn or other hawthorns, I want you to look for some of these reversions. Look for the thorns of the hawthorns. Here I have a photograph that shows you the hawthorn we're talking about. It's labeled G52. You can also find that here on this staked plate that says hawthorn and it gives the ID number right here. All of our Whitman campus trees have ID numbers. Here's Sudakawa, Sudakawa Fountain. It's uh, currently running in this photograph. It was not, but it is currently running. Okay, that was our first tree. How about our second tree right nearby? Can you tell where this is? Here are the tennis courts. This is MEM and Penrose libraries over to the left. And so we're looking just under a major branch of the prickly castor bean tree. Castor oil tree. I shouldn't say castor bean. Prickly castor oil tree. It is in the genus Calopanax, and the family is Aureliaceae. So the leaves of this tree look like a maple or maybe like that liquid ambar I mentioned earlier, but this tree is in a more obscure family, as I mentioned, the Aureliaceae. The flowers are in umbels that are reminiscent of the flowers of carrots or Queen Anne's lace, if you're familiar with that. And take some time when you, well, first of all, finding this tree, right? You're looking for bark that has these stout prickle structures on it. And take some time to rub your fingers on these prickles and think about whether you would want to climb this tree. I don't know of any theories for what particular animals these trees might be defending themselves from. Here is another photo, some more typical bark of this tree. And here is what most of the tags on most of the trees on campus look like. They have these ID codes. And so you'll know that you have the right tree if you find G67 on there. Okay, third tree. We're still in the Sudakawa fountain area. This is the giant sequoia tree, Latin name Sequoia dendron giganteum. And the species epithet there, giganteum, is for real. So these trees are the largest, that is, not the tallest, but the bulkiest trees on Earth. Many of you may have visited the General Sherman tree on the west side of the Sierra Nevada. And these trees grow where the rainfall is heaviest in the Sierra Nevada, between 5,000 and 8,000 feet in elevation. This is an example of a tree that has prickly leaves, prickly leaves or needles. Needles are just leaves. I hadn't thought of this tree for the prickly tree tour, but our campus arborist, Kirk Huffy, who climbs our trees to maintain them and has a lot of intimacy with their surfaces, he pointed out that this is a pretty pretty sharp tree. So try it out. When you walk up to a giant sequoia, grab some of those needles and feel how pointy they are. In botany, these are referred to as awl-shaped leaves. And so let me just say to you, this little projection right here, that's what counts as a leaf. Not this whole thing right here. This thing, this projection here, is a branch with many, many individual all shaped leaves. When I say this word all, my students don't know what I mean. It's a generational thing. It's also a familiarity with hand tool thing. It's not clear that this shape actually has anything to do with defense for these trees. It may just happen to be an efficient shape for photosynthesis and gas exchange for these particular trees. I, I don't actually know. I don't have a photograph of the giant sequoia G45. There are actually three of them near Sudakawa Fountain. But I do have a photograph of another group of three that are over here um, by Science. And this is Olin over here. So these three trees here, those are all members of the Sequoia dendron giganteum species. All right, let's switch locations. 
So now we're going to go over to what I'm calling the Baker Street location. That's between the railroad tracks and Cordner Hall. So here are the railroad tracks right here. Here's the stop sign. This is Park Street. Science Hall would be over here in this photograph. And there's a, low, a row of honey locusts right here. And a little bit more to the right is a spruce. And I want to talk about spruce trees in general. So here is a typical twig of a spruce. Notice how knobby it is. Spruce trees are known for having knobby, prickly twigs. In fact, this character is used to distinguish them from firs in a lot of taxonomic keys. So you'll come to a point in a key where it asks you, okay, when a leaf or needle falls off, does it leave a smooth scar or does it leave a bumpy scar? If it leaves a smooth scar, then you're going to go over to the fir department. If it has a bumpy scar, you are in the land of spruces. Another character that helps you identify spruce is that they have hanging cones as opposed to upright cones, uh, female cones. And here again, those bumpy twigs. And if you take a cone in hand, once it has fallen, it's a soft cone. It's not a prickly cone like you'll typically find in the pines. All right, so there, there is a lovely spruce for you to approach and find those twigs. Even on the ground, if you look down the ground, you'll find these twigs with all these nubs on them. You can say to yourself, I bet, I bet that's a spruce. You might be asking yourself, by the way, why I've got gloves on. So I'm in a teaching classroom. It's a shared space where uh, faculty members might be recording lectures for students. And so to protect myself from any kind of uh, virus transmission, I do wear gloves when I'm in here. All right, our next guest, whoo, is the honey locust. Gladitia triacanthos. This is a species that, like the hawthorn we saw at the beginning, can be substantially armed. This one's even more armed. For scale, this photograph that I have up here, here is that very same branched, amazing thorn. Okay, you do not want to poke yourself in the eye. I have this in my office. I keep it in my office, and I worry that maintenance staff or um, any of the janitors might drop this and hurt themselves. It is, it is quite the weapon. So these hang from the trunks of the tree. So these do not come off rigid. If you were to touch one, it would actually wiggle a little bit. It moves. It's got sort of a soft, uh, flexible connection to the tree allowing for movement. But this row of honey locusts that we have here along Baker Street, along the railroad tracks, these are not armed. Like the hawthorn cultivars, these honey locusts rarely revert to their ancestral form, but you can find it. So if you walk at the base of these trees. Now recently, Kurt came through here and cleaned all these up. So, um, or maybe, maybe it was other members of the grounds crew, but in any case, there isn't a lot of uh, growth around the base of the tree. But when there is, when it sprouts, often those sprouts will have the thorns on them. So honey locusts are named for this character right here, the honey part anyway. If you break open these giant fruits, they're legumes, here are the seeds, you'll find this very viscous matter that is quite sweet. I licked the surface right before I took this photograph just to confirm that it in fact is sweet. And these fruits are breaking down right now in the lawn. You'll find some hither and thither. And the uh, for the dispersal of these seeds, it seems obvious that the tree would want to have animals around that are going to eat these fruits, eat these seeds, and move them across the landscape and deposit them somewhere else. It's a way of moving around. And the evidence that this is so is that the tree is producing this sweet substance. 
let me show you right here. This tree is native to the North American continent. Here's its geographic distribution. I lost my place here. And in its native range, it is a prickly champion. So let me show you some photos from the internet of what these trees can do in their native range. Look at that. And remember, these are not rigid. They can move. So if you were to try to climb this tree, all those pointy ends would travel with you, right? They would kind of drag along. It's extremely intimidating. Here's another one. So you might ask yourself, against what herbivore would a tree need to defend itself from this much? This is so extreme. What animal can you think of for which these armaments aren't overkill? And it has to be something pretty big. A small animal like a squirrel can get right around these. So it's got to be something big. The current explanation is that the herbivore in question is not one that we can think of for right now. It's one that is extinct. These trees likely evolved in the presence of mastodons. You may be aware that elephants have no problem ripping acacia trees down and other trees, they can pull them right out of the ground. Well, mastodons were the same way. They could be very destructive. And we know that mastodons ate the fruits of these trees, of honey locusts, because we found them in the remains of their guts and in their, um, in their manure. So the mastodons are now gone. They're extinct. But these trees maybe in this expression of all this prickliness are remembering the mastodons. So when you walk along Baker and you look across the railroad tracks at those honey locusts and you maybe see a thorn here or there, imagine that that tree is remembering the mastodons. All right, here's our last stop. Another locust is coming up here on Shady Rill Street. So do you know the giant flowering cherry tree, the champion that's over here on Marcus Street? So if you were to keep going past um, Marcus House, you could make a right turn on Shady Rill, which is a cul-de-sac and I'm taking you there, it looks like this. So this is the end of the cul-de-sac, and these trees that you see here, these are all black locusts. Robinia sued acacia. I was delighted to read recently in the UB that Teddy Roosevelt remembered his stomp in Walla Walla in May of 1903 by the many blooming locust trees. They were even more common in this area then than they are now, and they're common now. They're dry adapted trees that are native to Eastern North America, and they're really appreciated for making hard, rot-resistant wood, excellent for fence posts. We know that black locusts were among the first trees planted by Marcus and Narcissa Whitman out at Wailapu. And in our dry farm landscapes to this day, we can often travel for miles and miles and only see black locusts punctuating the wheat fields. They are able to survive well in this environment. The Whitman campus used to have many more black locusts than it does today. They had become weakened with age and with the native locust borer, which is a pest on them, when the windstorm, epic windstorm of 2008, took down many of those trees and transformed the campus. Some of that wood became the atrium stairs of Science Hall. How about that? We have a nice cross-section of 
black locusts here at Shady Rill, but you can also see them at other places. You can see them out, I think I have a photograph here, no. Uh, oh, I have coming up. Oh, so here's the black locust. Let me switch gears. Here you can see how they arm themselves. Now, black locusts vary a lot in how much they arm themselves. And these spines, which are actually formed from stipules, so stipules are little, they look like little ornaments at the base of the petiole of a leaf. They occur most often on really young trees and on sprouts where there's been some kind of damage at the base of a tree. It's as if early growth and response to damage sets off a different morphology in these trees, a defensive morphology. And I have a photograph here. This is out at Shady Rill. Right here we have the Mill Creek Channel. So these are black locusts growing right up against the channel. And we have here a sprout near the base of the tree. And this sprout is the one that I had in my hand right there. So it's clearly showing the defensive morphology. But other branches nearby that you can reach don't have that morphology. So you can see examples of both forms right here at this location. All right, and I wanted to point out other, oh, did I? Okay, we're getting there. So here is a photograph of Larry Malott, a former arborist for Whitman College, showing damage from the locust borer on these old black locust tree branches. And what I was starting to say earlier was that there are other locations where you can see black locusts. So for example, out on Ankeny, uh, near, if you're going in the direction of Treaty Rock, there's a black, one black locust there. There's another one over here, just between the totem pole and Penrose House Bridge. These are black locusts right here. So if you're looking for some other black locusts, you have that opportunity. This photograph, you, maybe you can make that out, was taken in our small hailstorm Last week or the week before. All right, so that concludes our first ever online video remote tree tour. Thank you for your attention and I hope you get outside and get to visit with the trees soon. Happy Arbor Day everyone.